And what's happening, Transformation Church, and also to our guests, I want to give a shout out to the mighty men of Kershaw Correctional uh, Institution and all the other correctional institutions, whether male or female. Uh, we love you. We believe in you. We're thankful for the work that God is doing in you and through you. Though you are locked up, you are freer than many of us who claim to be free because your freedom is found in Jesus. And to our guests that are tuning in from around the corner and from around the world, welcome. Uh, we want you to know that Transformation Church is a community of imperfect people, but we are a community that loves a perfect God, and because his grace is sufficient, it gives us the grace to love each other. Also, this is a safe space for you to explore the claims and the person and the promises of Jesus. So let me pause here. Our worship team sang an incredible and beautiful and true song about God keeping his promise. Well, what does that actually mean? And before I dive into the message, I think that's really important. It means this, that in Genesis chapter 12, something profound takes place because in Genesis 11, um, creation, human beings are building a separate temple and a life separate from God. And so God scatters them. Why? Because he loves us. But in Genesis 12, he tells this man named Abram, who was worshiping false gods, I want you to worship the one true God. I want you to worship me. I want to make a covenant with you. I want to make a promise to you that if you trust me, I'm going to give you a family that's made up of all the families on the earth. And so the family that God lost in Genesis 11 and Genesis 12, he's saying, I'm promising to give us a family. And it would be a family that experiences his chisit, that's the Hebrew word for covenantal love. It's a family that he would care for, provide for, protect. It's a family that he would enter into the family business to become missionaries. This family began as the nation of Israel. He gave them a beautiful way to live, loving God, loving neighbors, love yourself, a distinct pattern, a way to live. Eventually, Jesus came because Israel could not fulfill their part of the obligation, and God, who was so gracious, who was so kind, says, you can't do it, so I'm gonna do it for you. So when Jesus comes, he comes to get his father's family back. That's the promise. And, and, and Jesus does it through a sinless life, his atoning, sacrificial, brutal death on the cross, his resurrection, and then his ascension. Right now, Jesus is fully God, fully man, right at the right hand of his Father. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in us to make us the body of Christ. And what's God's promise? His promise is to love us, to never forsake us, to grow us, to make us like Christ. And eventually, there's gonna be a new heavens and a new earth where there's no more tears, there's no more COVID, there's no more suicide, there's no more brokenness, there's no more ugliness. It is an eternity of adventure and beauty and glory and goodness. But until that time, Emmanuel, God with us, says, go and make disciples add to my dad's family. Sometimes in the midst of this journey, God does epic and, and powerful things, but most of the time, adversity becomes our university of grace, and God says, I promise that my grace is sufficient for you. Why did I take time to do that? Because if you don't understand God's promises, you'll think he's breaking his promise. So don't confuse the American dream don't confuse prosperity gospel with the true gospel of God's promise to be our king, to be our God, to be the one who transforms us to join him in bringing heaven to earth. So that's a little mini sermon before the big sermon. We're walking through our Christmas series. Um, Advent is a time, and that word Advent is a Latin word that just means coming. It's a time that we really focus on Jesus and his incarnation where, where light broke into darkness. And we're looking at a paradox. We're, we're looking at how the Messiah, which means king, how the king comes, but not in a way that we would expect him to come, or at least the way I would come if I was king. 
So it's a paradox, and what exactly is a paradox? A paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that, when investigated or explained, may prove to be well-founded or true. So uh, let's go back 2,000 years. Let's go back to the ancient soil of ancient Israel, the first century, second temple Jewish context where Jesus and the early church flourished, where the Hamashiach, the Messiah, the king of the Jews, the king of the world, the savior comes and and he's living and he's being and it just doesn't make sense because in the ancient world, kings were like Caesar. Um, they, they were the Caesars. They, they were powerful. They didn't lead by love. They, they led by domination and cruelty and bullying and military might. But the true king comes in a much, much different way. And just like in today's world, nobility or royalty does not hang out with like the common folks. Um, they are separate, they are far away. And the beauty of Christmas, the beauty of Advent is what we call the incarnation. It's a Latin word that means put on flesh. So, so teenagers and preteens, uh, Jesus, the eternal God, the son, the second person of Yahweh, the triune God comes to earth and he becomes a man, 100% God the Son, 100% man. God put upon flesh and temple, tabernacled, and dwelt among us. And so the king had come. But the paradox is this. He wasn't a king in a palace. He was a king born in a manger. He wasn't a king that came in Air Force One. He was a king who came in the womb of a 12 to 15-year-old girl. He was a king who came from a group of Jewish people called the Adawin, which were the poor class. In other words, he grew up in the trailer park. In other words, he grew up in a part of Nazareth that you don't cross the tracks to. He's a God who's accustomed to suffering and pain and brokenness and oppression. He's a different kind of king. And this king befriends the most unlikely people. Check this out. Jesus, the friendly king. Christmas is about Jesus, how he befriends unqualified people like you and me. We're gonna look at Luke chapter five and we're gonna experience verses 27 and I believe like all the way down to like 32. So check this out. After this, Jesus went out. So, so here's the friendly king. So so here's the one that created the Milky Way galaxy. And as you great astrophysicists know to watch Transformation Church, that that Earth is in what's called the Goldilocks arm of the Milky Way galaxy where it's just perfect for life, that the sun is right where it's supposed to be, that everything is is so fine-tuned that it has the imprints of a designer, and the imprints of a designer is the one with nail-pierced hands. Well, well, he is amongst the people. He is out and about. What is he doing? He's looking for the unqualified, which, by the way, is all of us. Verse 27, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax office, and he said to him, follow me. Time out. Stop the presses. Oh, my goodness. Oh, M-G, what in the world is happening? We know from Matthew 9, 9 that Levi is Matthew, right? And the word Matthew in Hebrew means God's gift. So, so who is this man, Matthew? Who, who is this man, Levi? And what does it mean to be a tax collector? Oh my gosh, this is so important. And it's so important for our day right here, right now. So to become a tax collector, you first and foremost had to become money. Why? Because you bought that job from the Romans. Who are the Romans? The Romans were godless pagans who oppressed the nation of Israel. Also, not only did you get taxes from your Jewish kindred to give to the Romans, you also got taxes for the Herodian dynasty. What is that? Glad you asked. So when the first temple, Solomon's temple, got destroyed, a gentleman by the name 
of Herod the Great. And when you go to Israel, you learn everything about Herod the Great because his fingerprints is all over Israel. He built incredible buildings, incredible monuments to his greatness. Who was he? Well, Herod the Great was a political mastermind. He was half Jewish and half Edomite. So the Jewish people didn't really like him, but this is what he did to appease their religious fervor. He said, I'm going to build you a temple. So when you hear me say first century, second temple, I'm talking about the work of Herod. Herod built a temple, and for the Jewish people, the temple is where heaven and earth met. On Yom Kippur, what would take place? Sacrifices, the forgiveness of sins, worship, prayers, all those things. And so Herod had his political position because he was in cahoots with Rome. Friends, this text right here is incredibly filled with political emphasis. So, the Jewish people hated tax collectors. Why? Because they were traitors. They took Jewish money and gave to the oppressive Gentile Romans. They took Jewish money and gave to the Herodian dynasty, which the only reason the Jews put up with Herod was because he had the power of Rome behind him. He knew how to use politics to appease the religious masses. And he would take money and give to him. And so tax collectors in that time would have been excluded from going to the synagogue. They would have been excluded from going to the temple. In other words, they would have been excluded from the very religious life that they needed. And when I say religious, I mean the forgiveness of sins through Yom Kippur and, and, the, and the various things that Jewish people would do at that time. And so when Jesus comes, the friendly king, guess what he's doing? He is sitting down with not only what the Jewish people would consider a political opponent, a religious opponent, but also the worst of the worst kinds of sinners. And what does Jesus do, the friendly king? He tells Levi, follow me. And for a Jewish rabbi to tell a man or a woman, well, Jesus was the only one that told women to follow him. But let me get back to the story. For him to say, follow me, and you are totally unworthy. Do you know what that would have done to Levi Matthew's heart? For him to go, oh my gosh, I, I'm not sure if this rabbi is like the real deal, but nobody else pays me any attention. He, he gets hate mail. His, his IG DMs are filled up with, with all types of stuff. He's a political traitor. He's all this. He's all that. He's on the wrong side of politics and, and all this stuff. And, and who's right there? Jesus says, follow me. I, I don't know what your brokenness is, you don't know what my brokenness is, but it's not too big for Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. And when he follows him, that, that's, his, that's, his, that's his born again moment. For those of you new to the faith, to be, to be born again, what does that mean? Does that mean that we come out of our mother's womb again? No, it means that we come out of a womb called Jesus' tomb. There's a supernatural thing that takes place that when you say yes to Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me, Jesus, I need you, there's this, there's this action that takes place that transcends time, that transcends place, that upon the cross, somehow you were there with him, that in the empty tomb, you were there with him. And when he got up out of the tomb, the Bible says you got up with him. The apostle Paul even goes so far to say this, you're made alive, you are raised to the heavens with Christ, and you are seated with Christ. We will spend all eternity on our faces, snot nose, 
ugly face crying at that kind of grace. So you need to know, if you're not a follower of Christ yet, not only does he want to forgive you, but he wants to raise you to life. He wants to raise the person that you could actually be for his glory. He wants to raise you up. And here's what's beautiful. It's a free gift. It costs you nothing. It costs him everything. So watch what happens next. So, so, so Matthew meets Jesus. Uh, so this friendly king, J Jesus calls us, his friends, to participate in his kingdom. And his question for you and his question for me is, have you sold everything to join him? You're going, wow, that's really strange. Well, it's actually quite beautiful and liberating. Watch this, verse 28. So 27, out of nowhere, Jesus sees the worst of the worst, a political opponent, an adversary, an unqualified person, the scourge of Israel, and he's like, yo, follow me. Verse 28, so leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Now notice, now listen, Matthew, Levi, uh, yeah, he was ostracized, but oh boy, he had political clout. Why? Because he worked for the Romans. Don't roll up on him. He had the Romans back. And he worked for the Herodian dynasty who had Rome's power as well. So he was protected militarily. He was protected politically. And he had that sweet moolah. He had that money because tax collectors were notorious for greed and corruption. And he leaves that behind. Hey, here's a question for, for, for you. And if you're not yet a follower of Christ, this isn't for you, but I want you to hang on. What, what have you left behind to follow him? What has Jesus asked you to leave behind to follow him? As a matter of fact, this Christmas, you know, we, we, we got our gifts. Hey, by the way, how hilarious would it be like if you woke up at like, 2 a.m. and I was coming down your chimney and I was like, what's up? Where the milk and cookie? That would be hilarious, wouldn't it? If that happens, go to a doctor immediately because it ain't me. Okay, so, so, so oftentimes we think of gifts as blessings. Well, when Jesus says, follow me, sell everything, it's the gift of subtracting things out of your life. It's called a blessed subtraction. So, so when we follow Jesus, we don't give up things to earn salvation. We give up things as a result of experiencing his promise of salvation. So, so here's a question that I got for you. Are you ready to give up comfort? Uh, for many of us, our, our spiritual growth has been stymied, our development has been arrested because uh, we think that God's greatest goal is our comfort but not our character. Now, hear my heart, okay, because this is, this is really important and, and I wanna pastor you through this. Adversity is God's university of grace and one thing that COVID has done, one thing that this recession has done is it has showed us what we're truly truly relying upon. My prayer for you and my prayer for me is that circumstances do not dictate our praise, that circumstances do not dictate our worship, that circumstances do not dictate our discipleship, that circumstances do not dictate saying, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For many of us, we want a Jesus of comfort, and God is saying, I use discomfort to build kingdom character in you and in me. Listen, don't waste this moment of suffering. If you're an atheist or agnostic, you're going to suffer anyway. Followers of Christ, we may as well suffer redemptively, meaning that God takes our discomfort informs our character. Are you willing to say, Jesus, I'm leaving that behind to follow you? Next, our, woo, hello, woo, woo, woo. Are, 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 you, are you ready to leave behind control? 
One of the greatest causes of anxiety is control. Control is one of the greatest illusions that we have. Are you willing to give up control? Because understand this, you may not know and I may not know what tomorrow's going to bring, but I do, but I do know the king who holds tomorrow in his nail-pierced hands. And because he's made a promise to redeem us, to restore us, to transform us, to invite us into his story for his glory, I can trust him. The Bible calls that sovereignty. Sovereignty does not mean that God controls us like we're robots. Sovereignty means this, that God is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end. He sees eternity past and eternity future in the present, in the moment, and his sovereign hand is his love, that he's working all things together. Now watch this, for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he predestined to do what? To be conformed to the image of Christ. Predestined means this, that whoever trusts Jesus, God's goal is to make you like Jesus. When you and I understand that all things are to make us like Jesus, and what would that be like to love like Jesus, to see like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to have compassion like Jesus, to be merciful like Jesus, to be strong like Jesus? That's God's goal. And we've got to be willing to give up control. And here's the thing, you and I don't have control anyway. It's one of the greatest lies that there is. Yes, you can control your actions, but that's really about it. God does very well at running his universe. And some of you are going, well, Derwin, man, I mean, what do you mean things are really bad? Friends, if we went back to the first century, we would be shocked. The average age of a man, his death was about 36. Disease, famine, wars was everywhere. So please be careful with chronological snobbery that this is the worst of time. Trust me, it's not. But God is always on time to do a timeless work in our hearts. What, what else, blessed subtraction, does God want us to give up? Oh, our political idolatry. God wants us to give up our political idolatry. Is politics important? Oh my gosh, it is so important, yes. We should exercise our right to vote, but as Christians, we should be able to disagree disagreeably. And listen, not everybody in every political camp believes everything that every part of that political camp believes, right? But our allegiance has to be to the Lamb of God. Now think about this. When you read the New Testament, right? When you read the New Testament, Look at Jesus and look at his apostles and look at the early church. Look at how they moved through the world with the kingdom of God. So please give up your political idolatry. Listen, if during this political season you've unfriended people and left pe people who are Christians, who are Christians, please reconsider Please reconsider, there's no perfect political party, but the church is called to be and do, right? And, and so that's why we care about babies in the womb. That's why we care about babies at the border. That's why we care about hungry pe people. We don't have to be so bifurcated. The kingdom of God is holistic and it's beautiful. My prayer is that we are more excited about Jesus and his kingdom and that we are not living in fear. We need some blessed subtraction. Ooh, here's another one, mammon. You're like, what in the world is mammon? I'm glad you asked. Teenagers, mammon is an Aramaic word for physical material possessions, money, cars, houses, what have you. For many of us, this is arresting our development as well. Now, what I'm about to say next is for a follower of Christ, and I'm gonna challenge you. For many of you, you're asking Jesus to bless you, and your giving doesn't bless his kingdom. You're going, God, bless me, bless me, bless me. And he's going, how can I trust you to bless me more or, or, or to bless you more when you're not even using your resources to advance the kingdom of God? Yes, times are tough, but God owns 
cattle on a thousand hills, and oftentimes he uses what's most important to us to trust and test our allegiance to him. May we be found not slaves to our possessions, but allowing our possessions financially to glorify God and his kingdom. Blessed subtraction. Oh, here's another one. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is any sex outside of a husband and wife. And listen, you are not your feelings. You are not your sexual desires. Some people go, well, I feel this way. Well, sometimes I feel like a fried fish taco. My feelings don't determine my actions. The Holy Spirit and his power determines my actions. For some of us, we are just lost in sexual immorality. And, and here's the thing, this is really important. In the ancient world, sexual immorality was tied into pagan cultic worship. What we do with our bodies is a picture of our worship. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, one and two, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know what living sacrifice means? It means that there's parts of us that have to die that we want to live. And here's what's beautiful. In verse 12, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The scene of the crime is your mind. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are blood bought. You are more than a sex drive. You are more than your feelings. You are the temple of God. I am the temple of God. It's a blessed subtraction. Have you left everything to follow him? And he gives us the grace to do it. Oh man, our hurts. Have we left our hurts? Have we left our hurts? A lot of times we like holding on to our hurts. Why? Why? Because it still gives us the power to have revenge even if it's in our minds. And revenge is like drinking nuclear waste and hoping that the person that hurts you dies and the only person that dies of spiritual radiation poison is you. Put your hurts in the hurt of Christ. And then lastly, our prejudices. Are we willing to leave behind our prejudices? Blessed subtraction. For Christmas, God wants to take harmful things away from us so that we can flourish. Matthew 13, 45 and 46 says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for, cheap, for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned to bought it. Jesus is the greatest of the great. There is nothing that compares to him. Back in the day, Vicki and I used to listen to a song called Sinead O'Connor. The song is forever sketched into our psyches. Why? Because that's when we first started dating and she had a song that said, and nothing compares to you. It's true, she was just talking about the wrong person. The only person that nothing compares to is the person of the friendly king, the Messiah. And here's one of these things is, is I can tell you about him. I can preach to you about him. I can, I can tell you that, that, that before time began that he, that he had his eyes set on you, that he's seen your hurt, he's seen your pain, he's seen your brokenness, he's seen your rebellion, he's seen my hurt, my pain, my rebellion, and he still went to the cross because God made a promise. God has said, I want you to be in my family and I wanna grow you into the image of King Jesus. I wanna truly make you human. I want you to experience life but you gotta take the step through the door. And for those of you who've walked through the door, keep on walking. There are so many more rooms of grace to explore. Jesus, the friendly king, calls us his friends to embody his mission. And my question to you and me is, are we missionaries? Look what happens next. Luke chapter five, verse 29. So Levi comes to faith and he says this, then Levi hosted a grand banquet. Not a little banquet, grand. We know Levi had some money because of his business. 
So, so he throws this elaborate grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors who were reclining at the table with them. The way they ate in the ancient world is they were on their sides, they reclined. But here's the point. Matthew meets Jesus, and I can imagine him going to his other tax collector friends saying, hey, man, I met this guy, and I think he's the one we've been waiting for, that he's the king, that, that he is the Hamashiach, that, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, and he told me to follow him. I left everything. I found forgiveness. I found a God that I didn't think I could ever see. I, was, I believed that I was too damaged to be loved, but then I met him. You've got to come to meet him. You've got to come to know him. And so Jesus is sitting at a table, reclining at a table with who? The political opposition. You go, Derwin, where are you getting that from? I told you that about 25 minutes ago. Here it is, here it is. The tax collectors worked for the Roman government, the enemy. The tax collectors worked for the Herodian government, the enemy. And Jesus is sitting in the middle of political differences. Okay, you ready? Here comes some big boy and some big girl Christianity. What people of political differences are you inviting to sit at your table or are you unfriending to come from your table? How many friends have you lost in this political season? My question is, what did Jesus do? And besides, how can you ever win someone's heart if you unfriend them? How can you win someone's heart if all you do is argue with them? Notice that Jesus did not argue with Matthew about Roman or Herodian political philosophies. He came to him with a greater political philosophy called the kingdom of God. People who are immersed in the kingdom of God says, bring your differences and I want to sit at the table with you. And here's the thing, is people want to talk to you about Jesus. So if you want to change someone's opinion, their perspective, it happens over food. It happens over love. It happens over the gospel. Now, the gospel has implications throughout the world. It's not just individualistic. The gospel says this. Every human being is lovable and redeemable because they're made in the image of God. For God so loved the world. God is loving, therefore God sees us as objects of love. How do you see people who are different? So if I were to go to your Facebook page, am I gonna see a spirit of saying, hey, you know what, we may differ on this, but let me talk to you about the king. Because that's what Generation Z wants and the younger millennials. That there are more Generation Z and millennials than any time in history, and they are longing for this kind of a Jesus. So we find Jesus sitting in the midst as a Jewish man with the enemies of the Jewish people politically. And what does the friendly king do? He sits down to eat. In the ancient world, to eat meant this. I want to know you. At the end of the day, your humanity is enough for me to sit down. Are we willing to be these kinds of missionaries? I didn't grow up in the church, and and and. I often was just confused why some Christians think it's okay to be mean to draw folks. Now, yes, Jesus at the temple went off. He went ballistic. He did those things. But there's a whole theological construct to, to that, and you're not Jesus, and neither am I. But what we can do to be on a firm foundation is sit down with pe people. And loving people doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Loving people does not mean you're timid. Loving people means that you say, God, let me see them the way you see them. And isn't it cool that this political opponent of Rome, this man too damaged to be considered for God's kingdom, 
wrote the book called Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And like his name, God's gift, his book is a gift. I just wonder, how many people are in your sphere of influence who could become another Matthew if we would put on our missionary's heart rooted in Jesus' grace to say, come, eat with me, spend, spend time with me. I wanna get to know your story and I wanna tell you about the greatest story there is. I wanna tell you about a God who made a promise to get his family back, that he was so unrelenting in his promise, he sent his son to fulfill it. His son went to a cross and rose from the dead to invite you to the greatest banquet of all, the kingdom of God. Now, as we get ready to land the plane here, don't be a butt person. Don't be a butt person. Be a friend to sinners. Don't be a butt person. Be, be a friend to sinners. Now, before you think I'm saying a swear word, I'm not. I'm using a preaching uh, a device here because look at Luke chapter 5, verse 30 and 32. Whenever we see butt in the Bible, we know something big is about to happen. And in this case, it's not a, a good big butt for the people who are being butt persons. But... The Pharisees. Who's the Pharisees? It was a group of about 7,000 men who believed their job was to help Israel live out the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They took the Ten Commandments, added 603. Now they were at 613, and they believed that if all of Israel lived out the commandments, then the Messiah would come back. How sad is it? How sad is it that these religious people worked so hard to see the Messiah come, and the Messiah was in the neighborhood, but he wasn't eating with them. He was eating with the sinners. My God, may we not be butt persons, but friends, the sinners. You know why? Because that's right where Jesus is. If you want to know if you're close to Jesus, you'll be close to sinners. But the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? By the age of 12, listen to this, by the age of 12, a Pharisee knew from Genesis to Malachi that, that they pretty much had memorized the Old Testament, not verse for verse, but they understood the themes of all 39 Old Testament books. Isn't it amazing? They studied all that theology and did not know that God came for sinners. Oh, my goodness. Transformation Church, may that never, ever be said of us. May we understand that God loved the world. May we understand that Jesus said, go make disciples of who? Everybody. The Greek word for all nations Ethnos, that's just not just across the sea, that's across the street, that's across the political aisle, that's across the ethnic aisle, that's across the social economic aisle. Go make disciples, and he goes, lo, I am with you always, the one who is gracious, the one who is merciful, the one who loves sinners is with you to give you a heart like his. Verse 31, Jesus replied to them, and he's replying to me and you, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The genius of Jesus, the care of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, the friendly king, is on display. Like the great rabbi he is, it's an incredible paradox. He looks at the Pharisees, who all they did was spend time in the scriptures and religiosity, and he tells them, um, I'm a doctor, and I have not come to call the righteous, but to call the sick. In, in other words, I'm here for the sinners, and what's sad is their religiosity blinded them to their sin. Family, 
please don't let your religiosity blind you to your sin, to my sin. One of the ways that we know that our heart is beating with the love of God is we love sinners. And Jesus is sitting at a table with political opponents, greedy, corrupt, lowest of the low in ancient Israel, and he's eating dinner with, with them. And don't miss this part, Matthew, Levi, is the lead evangelist going, hey, I wanna introduce you to Jesus. Question, in this season of COVID, who are you introducing to J Jesus? Who, who are you praying for? And it's so easy in today's world, prayer, care, share, with, with technologies, and soon we're, we're gonna be meeting again. I want Transformation Church to be overrun with people who don't know Jesus. You know why? Because that is, is God's heart. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. May we be a people that seek and save the lost. Family, our worship team is gonna sing a song called Blameless. And as they sing, this is a part of the sermon. Just, just let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart let him minister. For many of us, we have been comforted. We have been strengthened. And we are not singing blameless. I just got told that, so don't worry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Unless y'all want me to sing blameless. We don't want to do that either. We want y'all to keep watching. Hey, family, let's pray. <laughs> pray with me. Yeah. Lord Jesus, 2,000 years ago, there was political chaos. There was ethnic tensions and prejudice. There was sin, there was greed, there was corruption, there was pandemics, there was sickness. In other words, it was just like it is today. But you came as the friendly king to bring about your salvation that pointed to the great banquet of the new heavens and new earth. I wanna to talk to those of you right now as you've listened. Maybe you are the Pharisee. Religion, 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 but without Christ. Or maybe you're Matthew Levi. Maybe you feel like, man, I have done too much. I'm too damaged. Listen, Jesus came to undo the damage by being damaged for you on the cross. The way Jesus undoes the damage is that upon the cross, all that you've done and all that's been done to you, sin, he becomes the place, the cross becomes the place where his grace deals with that. And through his resurrection, he, he invites you into this new life. And if you're the Pharisee in this story, your hardest thing is recognizing your need for him. The Pharisees were very, many of them were very self-actualized. Well, look what we're doing. And notice what the Bible says in John 5, 39. It says this. You search the scriptures diligently because you think in them is eternal life, but the scriptures testify to me. You can study the Bible and miss Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. The Bible is not the Bible in and of itself. The Bible points to the Savior, the Messiah, the friendly King, King Jesus. It's time for you to bow your knee to him. Maybe there's some things that you need to confess and to repent, to give to him. Let's do that. So as I pray, I wanna pray for those of you who are yet to follow Christ. This is your moment, this is your time. Let's pray right now. Say this to him, Lord Jesus, today I bow my knee and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I, I call upon your name, friendly king. Today by faith, I receive the perfect life you lived for me. By faith, I receive the death you died for me on the cross. By faith, I receive the resurrection life that you gave me when you rose from the dead and I enter into your kingdom by faith. Give me the power to follow you the rest of the days of my life. 
I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. What I want you to do right now, uh, before I finish up with the soul tattoo, is I want you to pull out your smartphone. There's gonna be a QR code on your TV. Click your camera link, and it'll open up, and that QR code will take you to our connection card. Every, everybody else, I want you to fill out your connection card too. That if you pray with me to receive Christ, would you check, I prayed to receive Christ? Let us know, then that way we can know how to serve you. We can know how to help you. And the great thing now about technology, we are a church without borders. So if you wanna become a part of this Transformation Church family where you are, we have the capacity now to get you connected, to get you discipled, and for you to be a missionary influence in your context, okay? Awesome. Okay, fam, here's our soul tattoo. I want you to light an Advent candle. This is candle number three, and marinate on King Jesus, our friend. You can do that through the sermon illustration. You can do that through the Advent guide. We've given you so many resources to be able to grow. Talk to your children about that. Spend time, just little words of grace. Our, our, our teams have gotten great things for our kids as well. We want to disciple everybody. What's our action step? Be a friend to someone who doesn't follow Jesus and invite them to our Christmas Eve service. I pray that your heart and my heart would be tenderized by those who don't know Christ, regardless of whatever label they have on them. Their most important label is sinner in need of grace. Sinner is a term of endearment. It's a term that God says, I've come to save sinners. I've come to save them. I've come to rescue them. I've come to love them. I've come to make them new. I wanna share with you a couple giving announcements. So as you know, we're in a, just a crazy chaotic season. It hadn't caught God by surprise, but it's an opportunity for the church to surprise the watching world. In Transformation Church, because of your generosity, we are gonna be able to partner with the Steve Smith Foundation. Uh, yep, Steve Smith, the Carolina great wide receiver. Uh, we get a chance to partner with him. We're gonna give $20,000. So know that if you've given, you're giving $20,000, and guess to, to, to what? To Homeless Virtual Learning Center that supports the homeless children of Charlotte with tutorial meals and one-on-one -on -one mentoring through their virtual learning Center. Hold on a second. I, I need to. It's hard enough to learn on a screen, right? But can you imagine being homeless and trying to learn? So I want to applaud Steve Smith. Steve, Steve loves the Lord. We love the Lord. And your $20,000 is going to go to help some kids Get food, tutoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and just pray with me right now. Lord, I just, I just pray for every one of these kids that adversity would be their university of grace and like a rose that grows through the concrete, their lives would be a testimony to your hand. May they be encouraged by you. May this gift encourage them to do things for your kingdom in ways that's unexplainable but that only can be expressed that Jesus did it. Amen, amen, and amen. And family, we're not done. Um, as you know, uh, there are people who lost jobs, there are people in need, there are food lines throughout the week, there are food lines here at Transformation Church because of your generosity, we're able to feed, but there's also people who have utility and they need housing assistance, but because of your generosity, listen to this, we're giving $40,000 gifts to four organizations that offer emergency assistance to the community, each in the surrounding region around, around, around us. 
Mecklenburg County Crisis Assistance, Union County Common Heart, Lancaster County Hope in Lancaster, York County Hope House in Rock Hill. So that's $60,000 this week that you are giving to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Right where you are, in your home, on your bike, let's just clap because in times that are tough, people hoard and people hold on to, but you're being generous, you know why? Because Jesus is holding on to you and I believe, Transformation Church, that through this, we're gonna grow, that through this, Jesus' church, his kingdom is gonna be more beautiful, you're gonna be more beautiful. God is moving, he is moving, he is not stalled, and he is using you, and where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. Oftentimes, our checkbook is a reflection that checks our heart to see where we are. Transformation Church, I love you, I'm proud of you, and for those of you who have not started to give, you don't give to get. You give because you receive the greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus Christ.